Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Judy Green, Director of the Welcome Centre for Cultures and Environments and Health, and I'm absolutely delighted to give you all a very warm welcome here for those of you here at Queen's and also for the people joining us online to our 2023 annual public lecture, which this year we're hosting in collaboration with Igenis, the Centre of, for the Study of the Life Sciences. Now, both of our centres are absolutely delighted and honoured that Professor Hannah Landecker has agreed to present our annual lecture for the year. Professor Landecker has joint appointments in the Life and Social Sciences at UCLA, where she's Professor in the Sociology Department, and at the Institute for Society and Genetics, which is an interdisciplinary unit at UCLA and committed to cultivating research and pedagogy at the interface of the life and the human sciences. And she also co-directs the Centre for Reproductive Science, Health and Education at UCLA. So Hannah, Hannah Landecker's work truly encapsulates the, the, the transdisciplinary reach of many of our colleagues across the Welcome Centre and Igenis. And many of us have been inspired by her groundbreaking social and historical studies of biotechnology and the life sciences over the, the 20th and 21st century, um, including her 2007 book, Culturing Life, How Cells Become Technologies, Became Technologies. And her new forthcoming book, American Metabolisms, which traces the changes wrought by new understandings of how human metabolisms have changed as a result of industrialization, has takes up some of those themes. And I know some of you were lucky enough to have um, a workshop um, last, last week um, that, that looked at some ch uh, forthcoming chapters of that and the rest of us are very much looking forward to seeing that in print, taking up themes from her influential writing on nutritional epigenetics, where she makes the compelling case for treating food as an exposure, not something broken down by the body, but food as part of the environment that changes how our bodies work. Her work has profound implications for how we think about the relationships between insides and outsides of bodies and between the boundaries of bodies and environments. And um, before I saw the title of, of her talk this evening, I was going to say Professor Landecker's work has also been a rich source of new ways of thinking about and new metaphors for intervening and thinking <laughs> about, um, about the biosciences. But I'm I, 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 probably the point where I don't say any more and um, just pass on without further preamble to welcome Professor Han Landecker to give the public lecture on metabolism is not a metaphor from empirical studies of metabolic power to social theory. Thank you very much, Professor Landecker. All right. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, is someone managing the, the Zoom? I, I see some. Yeah, you don't have to admit anyone. Yeah. I also, we were pointing this at this and it's not, but the arrow keys are also not working. There we go. All right, let's see. Okay, technical uh, preamble over. Uh, I'd like you to start by admiring the fact that I managed to choose the PowerPoint schema that exactly matches this room. <laughs> <laughs> equivalent of, of choosing your outfit correctly. Um, so I, I'd first of all, just like to thank you so much, uh, both here at the Welcome Center and at Genis for, uh, for hosting me uh, and giving me this opportunity um, to uh, talk about metabolism some more, uh, which I very much enjoy doing. I'm never, I never tire of it. Um, the gist of my talk today is to propose that the contemporary metabolic sciences can be a resource for empirical and theoretical work in the social sciences and humanities. Um, but before we get to that, um, we should probably uh, make sure we're on slightly the same page given that metabolism is perhaps not a term that means everything, anything very exact um, to most social scientists and humanists. So let's begin with a shared sense uh, of its conventional understanding and, and indeed a sort of historical sense of what uh, 
solidified in the 20th century as metabolism, which I'll spend the rest of the time describing as coming undone. So a conventional understanding uh, represented, for example, by this XKCD cartoon uh, is that metabolism is generally understood to be about uh, food as fuel, food as building blocks. Uh, in its slightly more complicated versions, it's about processing oxygen, metabolizing toxicants for excretion, those sorts of things. Its classical definition is the sum of the physical and chemical processes in the organism by which material substance is produced, maintained, and destroyed, and by which energy is made available. So you probably are familiar uh, with this, uh, these contours. In the 20th century, metabolism was formalized as the object of study of the new to the 20th century, end of the 19th century discipline of biochemistry, quite separate from the domain of genetics and heredity. Uh, thus, metabolism also comes to stand for a very particular image of time, of endless circularity or these interconnected cycles and circles uh, that feed into one another as opposed to images of lineage or inheritance. It becomes the energy to the information of DNA, the cytoplasm's housekeeping role to the nucleus's executive function. It is the viscera and the grain. It is the soma that sloughs off with each generation as the germline forges forward over historical time. I would argue that in the 21st century, however, these categories are increasingly becoming troubled, indeed untenable. Uh, we could talk about any one of these points for the rest of the time, but I just give you a summary here of all of the ways or some of the ways in which I think that uh, many subfields in biology uh, and uh, uh, the health sciences in biomedicine, and to a certain extent, the ecological sciences are going through what we might call a metabolic turn or perhaps a metabolic return, uh, since in fields like cancer metabolism, you see uh, a, a significant revisiting of figures such as, such as Otto Warburg from earlier in the 20th century. But it is not a full return, of course. It is, it is a new metabolic turn with the technologies of metabolomics uh, and other kinds of changes. This metabolic turn, I would argue, is typified by uh, the uh, uh, attribution of agency to entities that were previously un understood depicted uh, and uh, worked on in experimental systems as mostly inert. Uh, for example, mitochondria, uh, typically understood as the powerhouse of the cell, the energy provisioner, always working uh, in service of other uh, entities and agents. Adipose tissue, similarly, long time role as a storage depot, that kind of end storage place for, as we saw in the cartoon, uh, sugars to be stored in the long-term uh, storage form as, uh, as fats. But of course, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, adipose tissue comes into its own right, redescribed as an endocrine organ um, that signals is highly ag agential today, is linked to all kinds of inflammatory processes, and in many cases is seen as upstream, not downstream. Many metabolites, microbes themselves, as I'm sure you've spent all day talking about, uh, have a new, new forms and combinations of agency. Another thing that typifies this metabolic turn uh, is the capacity for entities to be simultaneously bioenergetic, biosynthetic, and information bearing. So a recombination, a kind of confusion sometimes, about how things can be energy and information at the same time. This is a process of um, recovery, I like to say, from the starkness of these 20th century uh, categories that we saw uh, consolidating around uh, genetics and biochemistry. Uh, 
What I'm going to concentrate later in the talk on is something that I find very interesting, which is the recent emergence of the theoretical uh, centrality of compartmentalization, that is that the temporal and spatial arrangement, uh, the 20th century metabolic map is just flat and it has all these entities on it that are connected by arrows, but the importance not just of what those substances are or wh what an enzyme is, but where it is in what concentration uh, and its arrangement uh, in uh, space and time is, is coming to the fore uh, in uh, thinking about uh, metabolism. Another characteristic is a move from an outside in signaling. You've all heard of cell signaling probably, or even just hormonal signaling. The signal comes to the cell or to the tissue, it sparks off a reaction that uh, comes from the outside, it does something to the inside that, that, spawn, that has a response. This is not over, but it becomes complemented by uh, and thereby changed, supplemented by and changed by an idea that the cell itself or the tissue itself is a metabolic ground into which a signal comes, which decides what is to be done with that signal. In fact, there are thousands and thousands of signals and not all of them are acted upon. So the metabolic ground into which signaling arrives becomes determining of what is done with it. And this is related to a shift in focus from DNA and DNA transcription uh, to the time and space of post-transcriptional -trans modification. That means all of the things, we know the central dogma, right? The DNA, it makes the RNA. The RNA uh, is the basis for the, the, the construction of the order of the amino acids that makes the protein. But there's all of these things that happen after that linear sequence of the protein is, uh, is constructed. Uh, proteins go through uh, the parts of the cell that I always loved as a as a biology student, the, the endoplasmic reticulum, the, the Golgi body, what happens to them there, they get all kind, kinds of decorations and changes and modifications, these post transcriptional modifications. And how do you modify? Well, you need a, an enzyme, you need a substrate. It is a, a part of the metabolism of these entities to make them work the way that they do. So this interest and in opening up of the space of post-transcriptional modification is also a turn from gene environment interactions to protein environment interaction. And this I think is a very significant and wide reaching shift. Now you might say, okay, that's all very interesting for people who do biology. I don't care that much about transcription or post-transcription post or methylation or any of these fancy words. Why study metabolism as a social scientist or a humanist? Uh, let's pull away a bit from these arguments that I just made that are kind of history of science, philosophy of science, and say, well, okay, I'll take your word for it. It's, it's shifting. So what? So what's in it for the social scientist or the humanist to study metabolism? So conventionally, we might think um, directly, metabolism and its disorders are of social and practical and economic consequence for very important things. Food, agriculture, medicine, soil remediation, biological and social reproduction, and so on. And therefore, it warrants uh, getting critically engaged. That is to say, it's too socially important to just be left to doctors and biologists. The second sort of way that we might think about um, it being worth thinking about and on and around metabolism is that it has a philosophical and cultural impact on how we think about self and other, boundaries of the body, temporality or processuality, cultural understandings or representations of human and more than human life and their relationships. And I want to say that those are both really good reasons, uh, but of course I could never leave well enough alone. And I think there are actually more and more profound reasons why social scientists and humanists should engage with 
current metabolism. So it's an interesting and provocative domain for concepts, but what, what more? Sorry, I always do this. Okay. So this scientific concept of metabolism has, since its formulation in the 19th century, been actually an enormous resource for social and economic theory. Concepts of metabolism and metabolic theories in biomedicine and ecology and evolutionary biology have changed profoundly since the 19th century. And as I just argued, have accelerated this shift of change. This shift has accelerated greatly in the last 10 years. However, these shifts have not had appreciable impact uh, on the kinds of metabolic models that we do see in the social sciences, such as uh, in uh, geography, for example, uh, the metabolism of cities, uh, social metabolism work remains largely uh, an input output that is food is fuel, energetic, uh, what raw materials go in, what products come out, how much energy does it take to transform them, what waste does it make, uh, these remain largely input output or metabolic rift frameworks that are, I think, largely metaphorically metaphorical. Cities are seen to have metabolisms like organisms have metabolisms, that they have energy economies in the way that organisms do. I think that that's limited. And I'm not saying that it's wrong. Uh, I think, however, that it could be complemented uh, in really exciting ways uh, by engaging with contemporary metabolic sciences. As I said, things have changed a lot since the 19th century. So the question that I want to put to you today, uh, in part by working through some examples, is can we, and I, that's rhetorical, of course, we can, mm -hmm. tap the conceptual and experimental work now underway in the life sciences for a theoretical renewal in the social sciences that is directly translatable into novel empirical frameworks for sociological, anthropological, and political work. Moreover, can that novel empirical social scientific work speak directly back to the practical questions of metabolic science and how to live better in light of planetary crisis, one health, dysbiosis. So this is to say it's okay and it's a good enough reason to study these things because it's important for disease or because it's important for agriculture or the environment. It's a good enough reason to study these things because they are philosophically interesting. But in addition, I think there is this room for this kind of theoretical, uh, methodological, empirical circuit uh, to speak across uh, these different disciplinary domains. So the agenda that I am going to work through today is that biomedicine is taking a metabolic turn. I have uh, talked about this and ask how might today's metabolism serve as a theoretical resource outside of the direct domain of its generation, that is cancer, diabetes, or immunology. The example I want to put uh, before you is this example of metabolic compartmentalization. First asking, what is it? What is the significance of compartmentalization and its perturbation in the health and functioning of the body, especially in the Anthropocene? Why is it theory? And what might it suggest methodologically and empirically, even to someone who doesn't speak a word of molecular biology? Okay, so let me catch up with my slides here. <clears throat> so what is metabolic compartmentalization? Utilization. Put most simply, when you have sequences of chemical reactions, you often need to keep them apart from one another. By analogy, you might think of yourself as uh, standing in a chemistry lab and you need to do 10 different kinds of reactions. You're not going to do them all in the same vessel at the same time. That would mix everything up together. Uh, your substrates and your products will get confused uh, and you might blow something up. 
So you don't you don't do that. And uh, by analogy, um, uh, if a cell and by extension the organism is thought of as a multitude of chemical interactions happening both in sequence and in parallel, then it's easy to grasp why things might want to keep apart in some instances and might need to be crowded together in others. Biophysicists often point to these three major types of compartmentalization that you see on the screen. In chemical compartmentalization, the way proteins cluster together can scaffold both the proximity and order of enzymes that carry out a sequence of reactions. So the way they stick together actually um, is formative for the, the way a substrate and its products move across a sequence of reactions. These molecular complexes uh, are referred to as metabolons, which is a lovely science fiction-y word. Um, but in spatial compartmentalization, which you might be more familiar with, there's a membrane keeping one thing apart from the other, which allows for spe specific and uh, quite specialized microenvironments. In peroxisomes, for example, pH is more acidic than other parts of the cell, which is appropriate to the reactions and necessary to the reactions that happen inside it. Some metabolic sequences create toxic intermediates that one doesn't want getting around. Other times it's just um, one wouldn't want the intermediates diffusing away in cellular space before the next reaction can happen. You see also sometimes what are nicely called futile cycles. If the substrates and products of different reactions are mixed up, the cell futilely interconverts chemicals in competing uh, directions. Temporal compartmentalization is also robustly universal in the biological world. I know that you don't think of your genome or your microbiome sleeping and waking, but there is a distinct daily cycle to which genes are being act actively transcribed and when both um, your in both your tissues and your microbes. Microbes also rest and have active periods. This makes some sense. You wouldn't, uh, for example, want to be making a whole lot of digestive enzymes in the middle of the night when you're fast asleep and not eating because there would be nothing for them to do. And some of the sleep disruptions and disorders such as uh, irritable bowel syndrome that were ascribed to simply waking up because of discomfort from symptoms are now being rethought in terms of the microbiome being active at the wrong time or losing its rhythmicity. So in short, we see structural and temporal compartments of all kinds giving the usual flat lots of arrows map of metabolic cycles, a topography inside cells, tissues, and organs. So you'll be most familiar with this kind of image, I think, uh, the idea of com compartmentalization from looking at images of the eukaryotic cell, which has evolved many membrane bounded compartments that keep various processes uh, separate. But it does actually extend all the way up and down the scale. As this interesting figure from a recent paper by Liron bar and Nora Corey shows, Compartmentalization is found throughout the whole range from orga organismal to molecular organization, and larger compartments are themselves parsed into many smaller microenvironments. Took me a long time to sort of figure out what was happening in this uh, in this diagram with the combination of the Russian dolls and the um, body parts. But what you see there is um, the, the liver. The liver has a little, this is the liver closer up, uh, the, the organ tissue. This is a bit of the tissue closer up, the cell. This is the organelle, and these are the enzymes. So in each of these, in the tissue, there is spatial organization um, of different kinds. You have different uh, regions in it. In the cell, you have compartmentalization. In the organelle itself, you have compartmentalization. And the enzymes, as I said, might be uh, structured in the way and the order that they work or the time at which they work by different uh, uh, compartmentalizations. Mm -hmm. 
So a 2015 paper on biofilms illustrates these principles, I think, really nicely. Uh, this is from the Sewell Lab at UC San Diego, and they used microfluidics and time-lapse microscopy to observe growing biofilms. Biofilms, of, of course, are a problem for antibiotic resistance and chemical control because it's hard to get to the cells in the middle. You have this complex structure of uh, many, many bacterial cells, and the ones in the middle are hard to get to with uh, chemical or pharmaceutical treatment. The researchers discovered that when the biofilm reaches a certain size, it begins to oscillate in its growth. The paper theorizes that oscillating growth is a manifestation of what they call metabolic codependence a relationship organized spatially within the biofilm. The interior cells produce a metabolite, a nutrient, necessary for the growth of the bacteria on the outside. So the inside makes something that feeds the outside. This provides the inner cells with the ability to periodically slow the growth of the outer cells, which otherwise would co consume all the available nutrients and starve the cells on the interior. By periodically preventing growth on the periphery, inner cells ensure that they have sufficient access to nutrients. Yet at the same time, by keeping the protected inner cells alive, the biofilm has a much higher chance of surviving external stressors, such as antibiotics or disinfectants. But what they're saying here is that living together is not some kind of altruistic thing. It's a uh, uh, relationship of codependence that pulses uh, over time. The intestinal wall is also an ex amazing example of the importance of spatial and temporal organization. It's both a barrier and a zone of transduction. It is, as I'm sure you've heard much about, uh, even today, the place where humans and microbes have very close interactions. Uh, in, in that that is where uh, some of the human microbiome uh, uh, it is. it is the example of the gut wall that we begin to see that compartmentalization is not a static property of life, where there are barriers and portals, as all these static cross sections might imply, but that boundedness itself is an emergent property of the interaction of humans and their microorganisms. It's not just that they live in us, but that we both participate in making this kind of gut wall or other boundaries that constitute us, that constitute an us and a them, and an enduring relationship of codependency in the first place. So the wall of the human intestine is very intricately folded and has many projections called microvilli and is composed of a single layer of cells. Perhaps surprisingly, the epithelium lining the intestine is sometimes called the body's largest endocrine organ because about 1% of the cells have an endocrine function, sensing nutrients and bacterial signals and transducing them by secreting hormones and cell signaling molecules that go on to affect satiety and appetite and nausea, and even bodily assessments of the volume and amino acid content of ingested food. Looking more closely at one of these intestinal crypts, we see that the single layer of epithelial cells is only one part of the physical structure of the intestinal boundary. That boundary itself is compartmentalized, though not by a membrane. The goblet cells, uh, the, the blue ones with little green things coming out of them here, goblet cells, are specialized to excrete mu mucus, which you see in the darker turquoise color down here. And this mucus creates a continuous layer over the epithelial cells. You'll notice that in this depiction of a healthy gut wall, there are no microbes in the mucus closest to the epithelium. So we don't see them here. They're all up here in the, the lighter colored section. In fact, what you find here are antimicrobial peptides. But mucus is very rich in nutrients for the bacteria and therefore provide a very specific niche for them uh, in this looser outer layer up here. The bacteria that live in the outer layer are busy breaking down dietary fiber, secreting short chain fatty acids, which are in turn a source of energy for the intestinal epithelial cells. This mutual beneficial relationship is one of very close proximity with distance. 
So they are close, they are kept close, but not too close. And you can see how this is a system that feeds in a circle. The bacteria feed the intestinal cells that feed the bacteria. So I'm going to skip. Okay. This carefully orchestrated architecture of cells and mucus is a site of intense immune system activity. Here again, you see the bacteria uh, depicted as living in the mucus layer. So they're uh, in, in this uh, case, it is the, the, the light blue uh, uh, layer. Um, <clears throat> But these authors are emphasizing the layer underneath the gut mucus layer called the lamina propria, which is busy with immune cell activity down here. So here's your single epithelial layer. You have the dense mucus with no bacteria in it and then the loose one here. And here you have all kinds of immune cell activity. I won't go into detail, but there's a great deal of crosstalk between the commensal bacteria and the immune cells down there in the lamina propria. Bacterial metabolites such as indole cross and signal to the epithelial cells to enhance the tightness of the junctions between them. The presence of bacteria induces both tolerance and defense. There is also a temporal component to this relationship. The population of the bacteria in the gut, as I said, shows a circadian rhythm and temporal compartmentalization. And while I've been talking mostly about the human or what scientists have used mouse models to say about the human, there are many other organisms such as this corn species in Mexico that has a thick mucus layer around its aerial roots. The layer is home to bacteria that fix nitrogen from the air, supplying the plant with much needed essential elements that it cannot get from nitrogen poor soil. So in short, what we learn from the general theory of compartmentalization and the specific example of the gut wall is that togetherness or codependency is paradoxically a constant work of separated togetherness. Rather than being an autonomous being that converts the world into itself, the very way that we are beings with a distinct outline that maintains an integrity over time is to be in constant dialogue and interlocution over this boundary. Gut integrity is a continuous process of interlocution between ingested food, microbes, and bodily cells. It is not that human and microbe dissolve into one big under-differentiated metabolic network, but boundedness and compartmentalized organization is itself an important outcome of multi-species uh, interaction. Boundedness is a process, uh, not a thing. Okay, so all of this is all very well. I'm sorry to have just dumped all that detail on you. My apologies. Um, let's ask now, bring it back into the world. What does this utopic view of compartments bounded by metabolic communities that work together to produce the porous walls between them uh, what does it have to do with health and well-being, uh, particularly in the Anthropocene? Well, I would say that what they are and this sort of uh, relationship has come into view, uh, sadly, in part only because of concern about their degradation. <laughs> Indeed, it seems that industrialization has led to the paradoxical situation in which humans are becoming allergic to food. Observing, for example, that almost all babies tested in a 2018 study in Europe had antibodies reactive to milk and eggs, while the rise in general allergy uh, to the world. Uh, for example, this study uh, found that almost all the babies tested uh, had antibodies reactive to milk and eggs. And there's also uh, an enormous rise in general allergy uh, manifesting as asthma ectopic dermatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Surfactants, enzymes, emulsifiers in processed food, cigarette smoke, particulate matter, diesel exhaust, ozone, nanoparticles, and microplastics are all entities that have had research done on them in that they uh, have interactions with and damage the epithelial barrier. 
A large number of these substances are encountered by humans as a consequence of industrialization, urbanization, militarization, and modernization. In particular, um, detergents used in laundry, dishwashing, and household cleaning agents um, have been shown to be directly toxic for epithelial cells, uh, uh, which is noted um, as in this review um, as a, a list of things like medical disinfectants, um, bleach, uh, and uh, many of these entities, which I'll come back and talk about uh, near the end, are actually themselves metabolic objects. You've all seen the ads in which uh, the, the fat stain is lifted from your shirt uh, with magical slow motion efficacy. Well, how does a detergent do that? It has enzymes added to it. You have a lipase added that's harvested from a, a bacterium or a fungus added to your detergent to do that. So it's not just that these are synthetic industrial product, products, but that various entities and objects of metabolic power uh, are uh, uh, active in um, uh, initiating uh, what are thought to be these allergic uh, uh, reactions. But it's not just in allergy. All over biology today, we are seeing these comments about the breakdown of uh, the integrity of compartmentalization as an underlying feature of many other processes. Air pollution comp compromises epithelial integrity at the lung surface linked to COVID-19 severity. Uh, in this other interesting study, the uh, integrity of the intestinal uh, barrier, its intestinal barrier dysfunction predicts uh, impending death in flies better than chronological age. One form of compartmentalization is linked to others. Shift work, which makes people eat and be awake at cross purposes to circadian rhythms of gene expression and microbiome function also results in physical compromise of this gut barrier that I just uh, explained to you. Indeed, the International Association for Research on Cancer has declared chronic exposure to night shift work a probable carcinogen. Likewise, light at night has been classified as an endocrine disruptor. So all kinds of entities and things in the industrialized world are seen to be uh, damaging to health, but very specifically in this uh, way of interrupting uh, not just one barrier, not just the gut barrier, although that's the one I've been focusing on, but disordering compartmentalization. So why is this a theory? It might seem a pile of facts rather than a theory. Um, so let's turn um, to ask uh, what kind of theory compartmentalization is in the life and health sciences. It's now seen actually uh, by some writers as a syst systematic characteristic. The authors of this recent review, Hallmarks of Health, for example, explicitly set out compartmentalization as one of the means by which to distinguish between health and disease. As sociologists of medicine uh, and the normal and the abnormal, we should be interested in this term. They write, life would not exist without organism intrinsic barriers that allow delimitation, electrophysiological and chemical gradients, yet still allow gas permeation, signaling across compartments, replenishment and detoxification. So spatial compartmentalization is a hallmark of health in this uh, theory. If a theory is robust, it should allow prediction. Thus, we see the recent announcement of the discovery of the world's largest bacterium, which to researchers' surprise, illustrates the principle that compartmentalization reduces entropy. And even though the classic distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, eukaryotes is the organization of genetic material into a membrane-bounded nucleus, this prokaryote shows just this kind of compartmentalization, probably due to its size. To pile another example on you, here is the example of rapidly increasing herbicide resistance 
that we see in weeds such as amaranth as they are increasingly exposed to high levels of Roundup and other control ag agents. Again, if compartmentalization is a predictive theory, then we might be able to predict that it will play a role in what is being called in these sciences a strategy of metabolic evasion by plants in the face of the chemical regime they're being subjected to. Glyphosate, the active agent in Roundup, works by inhibiting a plant enzyme central to protein synthesis. Here's a list of um, mechanisms of herbicide resistance, and uh, they're a bit complex, uh, but all of them in one way or another might be seen as metabolic strategies, altering the target, increasing the speed and ability of a plant to degrade the herbicide, decreased absorption or translocation. But the one that I wanna bring your attention to with this nice red arrow is the sequestration, in part because that's such a nice word, of a, an herbicide onto cell walls or into vacuoles. In other words, um, this strategy in particular shows that the plant responds to a ubiquitous environmental presence of a toxin by organizing it. It sticks it to its cell wall. It puts a vacuole around it. It's still there. It doesn't do anything to it, but it keeps it away from the enzymes that are central to protein synthesis so that the plant may live. And so this kind of strategy of metabolic resistance or metabolic evasion is another place where we see a metabolic turn, um, but also the kind of theoretical predictive power of compartmentalization to explain a whole lot of different phenomena. Okay, this brings us finally uh, to the question of whether contemporary metabolic theories such as compartmentalization give you, empirical researchers, a different way to parse your field sites and data sets? Does it give you a different frame in which to ask questions? Just as compartmentalization is only one example of theoretical renewal in biomedicine, driven by trying to cope with metabolic disorder, I'm going to pick just one example from within the scene I've opened for you in order to show how it might impact empirical questions that one might ask uh, with a metabolic perspective. So let's return to this table that I showed you earlier. As I told you, um, many of the substances in this table are enzymes. And enzymes, of course, are proteins that have catalytic power to turn uh, one form, uh, one chemical form into another. And while we are used to thinking of waste products or pollution or toxicants as the damaging thing, here we see something a bit different going on. Um, and that is that the industrialization of metabolism itself becomes a force in health disorders in the present. So we might look at a table like this and see not only is this having a strong impact on uh, the capacity of organisms such as humans to maintain the multi-species processual boundaries that are around them, but that it is the metabolic agents and processes of other organisms that are in there in the scene disrupting that process. So again, I'm not speaking at all metaphorically here about metabolic power. Um, I am talking about the harvesting, augmentation, and scaling up of the capture of enzymes. Uh, enzymes are grown at a mass scale, again, mostly from microorganisms, although they're occasionally extracted from uh, plants. Uh, papain is uh, extracted from green papaya and bromelain uh, from uh, pineapple, for example. But this diagram just indicates to you some of the uses to which mass produced uh, enzymes are put, and there are many. So what do I mean by industrialization here? I really literally mean the development of 
industries in a country or a region on a wide scale, but bringing into uh, mass manufacturing and industrial production of things that perhaps were not previously uh, 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 done. And what I say about enzymes is true for all kinds of other metabolic entities uh, here. Amino acids, antioxidants, peptides, fatty acids, metabolic hormones, aromas, and palatants. Uh, some of these are themselves constructed by using enzymes often attached to columns where the substrate is run over them in, um, uh, uh, in a, a, a continuous process manufacturing system. So on this table, for example, you see some of the large scale industrial processes that use immobilized biocatalysts. That just means that you stick the enzyme to the wall of the bioreactor as in this diagram, and you'll recognize some of the things in this table. Glucose isomerase is the enzyme that allows us to make high fructose corn syrup. Um, you might not recognize nitrile hydratase, which is an organismal enzyme that allows us to make acrylamide from acrylonitrile. Um, but there are some other more familiar ones there. So lipases, enzymes that work on fats, uh, are very widely used in a process called interesterification. That is that once we declared um, trans fats bad for health, uh, the search was on to find other fats that would stabilize foods. Uh, and many of those fats are made by using enzymes uh, to interesterify, to change the structure of those lipids to make them uh, good for baking cookies. Enzymes are also widely used in modifying and uh, changing uh, antibiotics and other uh, things. So this industrialization of metabolism is a very widespread process. Uh, we use it widely in the food industry. It's fundamental to all kinds of conversion processes across a range of commodities and industries which I think will only increase with the rise of directed enzyme evolution, which is a big field, especially these days in trying to make synthetic processes into biological ones. If we simultaneously pay attention to the role of temporal compartmentalization in this story, we see that the rise of industrial enzymes was part of a post-World War II manufacturing revolution towards what I called continuous process manufacturing. That just means the factory runs 24 seven. An example of an industry that underwent this kind of expansion and temporal uh, uh, continuity in this period at the end of the 1960s, uh, although the technical run up to it was quite long is sugar manufacturing. The discovery of glucose isomerase capable of converting inexpensive cornstarch to high fructose corn syrup utterly changed the sweetener industry in the 1960s and participated in driving the percentage of the population engaged in shift work towards its current levels of 20 to 25% of the workforce in industrialized nations. I think you probably thought I was gonna say high fructose corn syrup drove the obesity epidemic, but this is what you see when you look at the things that are interrupting the kinds of temporal compartmentalization that are so essential to organizing living functions, that perhaps the impact of the production of high fructose corn syrup is not what people eat, but the temporal structure of the societies in which high fructose corn syrup is a central commodity. The food industry generally participates in the re-temporalization of both eating and working. So this is a nice image that I found from uh, a magazine in 1953, from Fortune magazine. And it shows National Biscuit Company's new Chicago bakery opened in 1952. Uh, and the, the sort of text underneath the picture trumpets the fact that it is the biggest ever biscuit company built and it will produce $55 million worth of cookies and crackers a year. 
Against the aluminum wall, abstract patterned with the reflection of fluorescent lights, stands a trough of dough ready for one of the plant's 12 600 foot long band ovens. Each oven makes 15 million saltines from dawn to dawn. That's the text underneath this photograph in the Fortune magazine. So this re-temporalization, again, uh, I could go on at some length you know, of the necessity of enzymatic power to this. You might just think, well, you make crackers, you make them 24 hours instead of other times, but the role of enzymes in dough rising and all of these things is also very central to this um, retemporalization. So what methodological lesson can we take from that brief empirical tour through the story of enzymes? The first, I think, is that the industrialization of metabolism itself, processes, objects, and relations, is something that we do need to pay attention to. Um, it's poorly understood, uh, and as a social, technical, and economic, and cultural phenomenon, uh, it really is something that I think we can all step up to think about. I think it's also important to be historically reflexive about one's conceptual frame. So uh, what we might learn from this lesson is historical reflexivity about the basis of uh, what metabolism we speak about and why, how it might discipline one's view. If you were more material about your materialism, you wouldn't just look at the input and the output, uh, but uh, might reach into the matter of diabetes and irritable bowel disorder to think about uh, how we might need to um, rethink, uh, reinvent, uh, and innovate in our conceptual frame. I think at this point, input-output schema um, are really insufficient to understand how social flows of matter and energy are themselves changing metabolism itself, uh, again, iteratively uh, and literal, literally. We might say with our colleague John Dupre that everything flows, uh, but not at the same rate or volume or in time. But I would add also that just because it flows doesn't make it good. There's a kind of valorization of the breaking down of binaries and the overcoming of barriers and these kinds of things. But I've come to appreciate that sometimes keeping things apart and uh, in uh, order uh, uh, in space and time uh, might be a very good thing indeed. So to conclude, I just wanted to raise uh, perhaps go back into the more abstract realm of ethics and raise the question of metabolic, metabolic ethics, which we might see uh, as a framework for viewing human action in relation to a biology that foregrounds a scientific and philosophical understanding of life as a metabolic process. Um, if you prefer, it could be a metabolic politics, of course. But we can ask within this framework what allows people, societies, ecosystems, and metabolic communities to maintain chemical, spatial, and temporal compartmentalization. And again, with everything that I've told you, I don't mean some kind of static boundaries. I'm not yearning for the good old days of boundaries that kept everything separate and neat and tidy. But these boundaries are such important zones of exchange of separate togetherness uh, and their abrogation is at the center of questions of metabolic disorder in our current times. So maybe from this perspective, we could ask not just the practical questions of what kind of empirical histories we could open from this perspective, but is it an ethical question? Should integrity, the capacity to maintain, repair, and practice metabolic compartmental integrity be a value that we can pursue across scales when we ask 
for concrete alternatives to current modes of doing things. Given you a few examples, uh, we might think of shift work and light at night as a question of social justice or what Jonathan White has called uh, circadian justice. Um, we might think with Kyle White on the things that allow uh, a community to uh, exercise collective continuance. I would argue that uh, the means to maintain uh, integrity are part of the question of collective continuance. We might think with Nicole Redvers and her colleagues about uh, the what they've called molecular decolonization, that it's not just out there in the world, but uh, what I've just told you is the industrialization of metabolism is deep in there, uh, in all of these landscapes, these landscapes of membranes, these landscapes of uh, metabolons, these landscapes of mitochondria. And so given that they are there, then there is the question of what to do about them. And that is the end. Here are my, here are my sources and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Landecker. That was wonderful. We have got a few minutes for questions. Are you are you kind of happy to field a yes, few? Yes, absolutely. If there are, I'm if, sorry, I have no idea how long I talked for. It's okay. We've got a few minutes. If, um, um, uh, uh, please, sir. Yep. Hello, um, I'm Virginia from Ashley Yala Campus. Um, I was really interested in your slide when you showed the image of the industrialized. Um, metabolism as opposed to the pre-industrial metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually made me, well, made me think about something that I'm reading right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading through um, Charles Dickens and the perception of science in Victorian times. Uh -huh. And there's this one key scene in, in, in Oliver Twist. I would assume everybody's familiar with Oliver Twist where the, the undertaker of the workhouse, where Oliver lives in the very early years, complains that the people who are better fed, when they come into the workhouse, they die the fastest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the commentary I was reading made a comment on kind of how in Victorian times, there was a perception of different metabolisms by social class. Okay, the, the, the working class had a stronger metabolism that was fit for harsher work, whereas the middle class was more delicate. Mm -hmm. And that kind of underpinned a lot of the social, social principles of inequalities in Victorian times. So I wanted to ask you, based on these images that you showed, <clears throat> do you think that metabolism is stratified by, for example, social groups? Uh, yes, <laughs> I do. Um, uh, although there are a couple of other ways to answer that. So, so one thing is that I, I think that it would be more likely that Dickens was thinking in terms of constitution. And uh, there is there is a, a bit of a tendency to write metabolism back onto the 19th century um, in, in ways that we, we use a very 20th century image uh, of a system that, that um, what, I, what I was talking about, the, the food as fuel, as building blocks, these kinds of things. But we don't articulate even the notion of food as building blocks until the very end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And this idea that there are, there are anabolic and catabolic, synthetic and degradative and the role of oxygen and the fact that microbes have metabolisms and all those things, that's all 20th century stuff. So the concept of metabolism does originate uh, in the 19th century. I always like to say that there's no metabolism before 1839. Um, but of course, there's a whole range of other cultural resources, medical resources for understanding how food becomes bodies, what how how bodies live, all of those things, their ideas of the body as a, a place of concoction. Um, my favorite is elaboration, 
how does how does the bee make honey? It elaborates it. Uh, this is where we get the term elaboration um, from. So, so to answer your question within the literary frame, I would say that there are all kinds of resources being drawn there into those characters and that discussion um, that are that are that are beyond and more diverse than the scientific discourse of metabolism in particular. But to your point, um, I, I do think that we tend to think that um, socioeconomic status um, striates people by resources. So you either have enough money to provision yourself with healthy food or, or not healthy food. But from what I've seen in terms of uh, the ways in which um, uh, these sort of massive flows of industrial food come to be built through things like um, fat interesterification is that the foods themselves are socioeconomically striated. There is a reason why cheap food is cheap. It is powered by this kind of enzymatic power to convert very cheap substrates into outcomes of different kinds. And that you, you actually see a biochemical stratification that we could call socioeconomic of, of materials themselves. And they're not all food, um, but many of the things that bear on metabolism are. And I think that is actually a very practical insight that could be taken to public health uh, in, in, many, in many ways. Just, just sure. by asking about the metaphor and why I'm saying a bit more about it, absolutely uh, that, that it's not a metaphor and mm -hmm. talked eloquently about the, the, the very real industrialization of the talents and, and the way that, that, that um, is changed in the real world. But it's also surely we're also speaking of the ways that we can use those different other standards to, to kind of pattern the way that we think about. The social as well. Yeah. So is, is there not? Yeah. Do you want to resist that the kind of narrative mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the dangers of that? Say yeah. so just a bit more about what, yeah. what the dangers are of that, of that call of the. In, re in retrospect, it's a bit of a dangerous title to have provided because someone wrote to me uh, who might be online to <laughs> 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 say. Yes, metabolism is not a metaphor, but it is also a metaphor, you know. <laughs> and so maybe the title should be "Metabolism is not only a metaphor." Right? And it, it is, it is an emphasis that I wish to make. That I, I think that there is a role for saying science gives us an it gives us imagery. Uh, and I myself talked about the role of analogy at a certain point in the, in the lecture. And, and those are very important ways of understanding how, how narratives travel across domains and, and the kind of power that they have on one another because they start to resonate once you, you, have, you share those kinds of rhetorical structures. Um, but I, I just don't want the analysis to stop there. Yeah. The body is not like a factory in, in, in this sense, yeah. right? The body, the body is composed of constituted, constituted, it is constitutively uh, built by these uh, uh, processes of factory time. Uh, uh, and and factory substance in 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 all kinds of ways, and so I, together with um, uh, you know, one of my favorite epidemiological texts uh, is uh, by the science studies scholar Joe Dumit, who wrote a piece called "Substance as Method," which you know really really to me it was very uh, important kind of articulation of saying, well, even, even our conceptual theoretical structures about what, 
what relationships are or, um, or, or categorization or separateness or togetherness are constituted by particular substances. And if you really work with substances and substantial transformation, you see different things. Uh, and it's also pushing back, I guess, at the, at the information, uh, information framework as well, that it's not about calories, or it is also about calories, but about uh, many other substantial transformations that we can follow empirically and historically um, in and of themselves. <coughs> Um, thank you. Absolutely amazing talk. Um, in what ways are metaphors metabolic? <laughs> they consume everything. <laughs> and the poor other 163 other rhetorical terms are left in the cold. <laughs> um, uh, there is the meta. Uh, in both terms, maybe they are both meta historical events. Yeah, I was just going to ask about inflammation, which came mm -hmm. quite a few mm -hmm. times. I think has probably a similar kind of checkered history as like like metabolism, and seems to be an object of study quite a lot now and raised in lots of different ways. So I wondered if like, if that's come into the story much, what do you think? Um, yes, well, that would definitely require its own talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I think that there are very specific historical relations between inflammation and, and the metabolic turn uh, arising in part from the work on obesity uh, and both the uh, epidemiological observation of obesity and the correlation of um, adiposity with various forms of cancer at a time when um, various uh, things were being identified as uh, drivers of, of cancer that, that then turned out to be um, uh, inflammatory signals. Uh, and so you even see, I mean, it's a, a bit of a terrible portmanteau word. Um, you even see um, a theory of metaflammation mm -hmm. uh, uh, that I think the thousands, uh, I would say there. But this this trajectory, right, of, of severing that adipose tissue um, is agential, is also that it um, is the source of all kinds of cytokines that are inflammatory. And the rise of this theory that one of the reasons why adiposity or uh, some of these other metabolic uh, conditions are related to this very wide range of physiological outcomes, uh, that, that inflammatory processes are rising from too much lipotoxicity or too much adipose inflammatory signaling is it the sort of shared property of all these other manifestations. So that's a very specific kind of historical work to be done there, um, but I'm going to stop there because it's it's long and complicated. We'll encourage that next year's inflammation. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have we have time for one more quick one. There are two hands up, neither of which are capable of asking a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur and Chris, the challenge. Can you ask a question in um, a very short amount of time each? Arthur, start. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for the presentation. And I was thinking a lot about how, in the history of sociology, especially, there's been accusations of kind of a biological metaphors because they kind of are conservative or they represent the society as a body or composed of organism and tendency to homeostasis and conservation. And, and, I, and I wonder how your project and your research reacts to that potential source of critique of societies as kind of autonomous, not changed by human decided action or political, political action. 
Yes, well, it's very interesting trajectory through the Chicago School uh, ideas of of you know, cities um, having having metabolisms uh, and and indeed, I mean it, it's an interesting history in and of itself that I think um, some people have 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 worked on, um, and and I guess. It, my critique would be that it that it is a framework that is that is depends on metaphor that it is completely abstracted from uh, the the biological basis that it might have once been borrowed from and that that the the framework continues on but then where it began really changes over over time and so I think that it actually can be, as you can see, right? I think sociology should be suffused with biology. It, it should um, think with biology. It shouldn't be derivative of it. We have in the past used um, metabolism as a resource for social theory. Why wouldn't we do it again today? Well, we might not do it again today because biochemistry is kind of under, uncomfortable for many uh, people in sociology. But but that that kind of conceptual framework almost immediately becomes off and 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 treats something as static that actually um, should be incredibly iterative. And, and this is what I was pointing to. I mean, again, a totally other talk, but if we looked at the quantitative studies of social metabolism, okay, you know, you can say a certain amount about the raw materials, about the, the hinterlands that they draw from, about uh, the energy that it takes to convert things from one place, one form to another, about the heat loss, about the waste. But that's that's what you can say. You get if you use an input output model, you get a measure of input output. And and I think with um, the insights that we are gaining from things sciences like biogeochemistry, we also know that the the very um, processes of changing things from one form to another, the processes themselves are changed by what's going through them are changed by uh, these kinds of uh, uh, questions of where things are happening, when, all of these things. And that those models could actually be made very interestingly different if, if they engaged with theories of metabolism that are from now, not from 1890. Did you watch that, a really quick yeah yeah i'll try to make it this <laughs> okay um at risk of kind of collapsing us back into metaphor um i suppose one of the i was wondering you know i, I take your kind of critique kind of slight critique of uh, the metabolic rift theory but I wondered whether perhaps this model gives us another way of thinking about metabolic shifts. So I'm thinking about Koei Saito's recent book on Marx and Anthropocene and the way in which, yeah, um, that, that, that capitalism deals with the fact that there are these metabolic rifts by shifting metabolic processes. And what's interesting about your, disc your biscuit model is, is precisely that 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 shifts the processes. You want people to work for longer, so you create conditions that allow them to work for longer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just wondering where, how you would pitch up a kind of critique of capitalism from this, or where would you go next? Or uh, at risk of collapsing you back into something that we're talking about here, what would a metabolic justice look like? That's short. <laughs> <laughs> what would meta, yeah, what would meta look like in, in <laughs> which, which so, is a topic we were grappling with, so. So one of the things is that, that people tend to occupy this space very polemically, right? That, that they, 
they take you as saying those people are wrong and I have this other alternative and everybody should come with me now and, and do this other thing because those other folks are wrong. And I, I'm both not um, constitutionally uh, inclined to that style of thing. Um, and I would rather say, okay, let's, let's take um, the, the metabolic shift, uh, rift, et cetera, and, and, and really lean into it. Like, what does it look like if you, um, if you uh, say, all right, what are happening to the mitochondria in, in this capitalism? What are the mitochondria of capitalism? Capitalism is not the answer. It's not that we get this biology because we have capitalism. It is the beginning of the question. What is the, what is the life uh, and of course, I mean it literally. Um, what is what are the life forms that we are generating with this arrangement of um, incredibly powerful, reactive, um, energetic, uh, sticky, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, tasty, salty matter? What what is it that we are making? And so I, I don't think those, those, those models are wrong. I, I just think that they're overly abstracting and that they, they, tend to, they tend to be based in the 19th century. And, and the, or, or in the, they tend to read back, actually, as I was saying before, they tend to read back on figures like Marx. Um, our 20th century understanding of metabolism and, and they're not materialist enough about Marx's materialism in, in, a strange, in a strange way. So it's not, it's wrong, let's go this way, but yes, and like, let's, let's, let's actually lean into it more and, and pull it apart and complicate it um, much more. I'm not interested in universalizing theories um, that that give us excellent ways to abstract. I'm interested in useful abstractions that get us back into empirical stories that we haven't thought of telling, that get us back to a changed abstraction in an iterative uh, way. So there aren't any histories of enzymes. There aren't any histories of antioxidants. They're just, it just hasn't been an object for social historians or political theorists or anybody else. And why, why is that? Well, in part because metabolism itself goes unhistoricized. And, and if we do that, then what does metabolic rift, how does it change? and conceptual questions. Thank you very, very much. That was a fantastic contribution. You can see we, we would have had a, a debate much, much longer. But yes, sorry. I, I, um, thank you all, went on thank too you all online. Um, and thank you very much, Professor Lanzaker, for that, that contribution. Um, <laughs> I'm going to